back in the East, we haven't talked about the East, but in uh, Brahmin in India, primarily in India, these were the counting symbols that were being developed. <coughs> and they should look fairly familiar. This is uh, in antiquity now. <coughs> now what happens is that they weren't really discovered until Alexander, around you know, 330 or 340 BC, decided to conquer the world out of Greece. And he went uh, through the eastern lands, India, into Pakistan, farther than Pakistan, conquered all the peoples. Alexander was the last person to conquer Af 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 Afghanistan and the surrounding areas. It's the only country where he killed some of the people. Um, usually he colonized people and then set them in charge of their own fate, replaced a better government, uh, a bad government with a better government. In Afghanistan, he actually killed some of the people because they would take their dead and leave them in the streets, and the old people would leave them in the streets for the dogs to eat. And Alexander found that repulsive. Uh, again, there's a cultural clash, and so that was the only place where he had problems with people. There's a great story about the modern Alexander on uh, Kipling's book, The Man Who Would Be King. Talks about a very <coughs> soldier who thinks of himself as the son of Alexander. You can either read the short story of the night, which is really a good story, or read the movie, which is, a, which is also good with Sean Connery and uh, Michael Caine. Anyway, Alexander's the last guy, and he brought these numbers back to Greece. So the question was why didn't the, the Grecians capitalize on this? Well, the primary reason was because of that number at the end that's called zero. <coughs> the Greeks would not allow zero because that's what gave birth to the international numbers, according to Cassis. And so it was banned because in the Grecian world, the world was perfect, it was rational, it was proportional, and logic demanded that it stay that way and zero violated that. <coughs> So when Archimedes was trying to build his parabola, uh, he ran into what's called the Zeno's Paradox, and trying to catch a turtle. So see if you can catch the error in this logic. Achilles there is trying to catch the turtle, and uh, you take a picture, and then when he gets halfway to the turtle, you stop, and you see that the turtle's got farther. Then he waits until he gets halfway to the turtle again, take a picture. The turtle's gotten a little farther as well. Since you can always divide the distance in half forever, just rescale the drawing and divide by half logically forever, Achilles will never reach the turtle. Therefore, all motion is impossible. This was Zeno's paradox, and no mathematician had an answer for this until the 15th century. It lists, it lists it for there's no logical error in dividing by half and seeing that the turtle always stays ahead of Achilles. It's a logical truism unless there's some limit, right? And that concept of a limit didn't occur until the 15th century with people like <coughs> Leibniz and Newton and Mahatma Kappa. So when Archimedes was trying to build his parabola, he would form triangles. He would build triangles and triangles because he wanted to find the area of triangles. He would just keep finding, trying to find these areas in here. And he probably would have come on the concept of a limit when he was summing his triangles. He would have come to the concept that that's what he was doing when he was killed by the Roman soldier, who demanded that he immediately report. And Carthaginian says, "I'm too busy doing this," and the soldier killed him. So Greek philosophy basically <coughs> got stuck in the time warp. And over here, here we can see on the left the pentagram. And the pentagram is one of the Greek symbols of per perfection, which was picked up by the Christian world uh, in around about the year two or 300, by Origen and the rest. And you can see if you build a pentagram and put a star inside of it, and then inscribe a star inside of that, you get another pentagram. And again, inscribe another star inside of that and keep going on into infinity, you'll have these pentagrams yielding these five-pointed stars. And guess what the ratio of those is? It's the golden ratio. It's the same ratio of the rectangle to square root of five. So this idea of perfection 
which put the earth at the center of the universe and surrounding spheres of ever better perfection outside of us until there's a prime mover in the heavens that keeps all these spheres going was Greek philosophy. It was perfection. And that's the philosophy that rejected the concept of zero and limited it. And we saw that last lecture, or last time I talked about ethics, when Asia, right, was the first woman who tried to base her ethics, or, or, or there was no ethics at the time, but tried to base her morality on mathematics and ethical considerations and it killed her because she was against the revealed truth of the day. And that was right. So around the year 300, 400, when Hypatia was killed, the Western world went into what we call the Dark Ages. Went into the Dark Ages. Um, around the year, well, we know around the year three, uh, 300 or so, 320, in Turkey, and Turkey is uh, right over here on the map, that uh, Constantine just uh, founded Byzantium. He came out of Arabia, but he basically conquered like a risk game the rest of the world um, with really man of errors. So uh, he came out of here and he went through back out into Afghanistan like uh, Alexander did. Um, and then he went back uh, east through Gibraltar, up through Spain, but past the Pyrenees into what is today France, and do we know what stopped him up there? Does anybody remember what stopped him? Muhammad and his armies. History is Charles Charles Martel. Charles Martel, the Battle of Tours, stopped Muhammad. Seven, fifteen, seven, six, and the lion, and that was the start of what became the Roman Holy Roman Empire. Drove him back into what, what, what we now know as Visigoth, Visigoth country of Spain and they inhabited southern Spain in what was called the Al-Andalus uh, Caliphate until 1492. Um, out this way, of course, they just, until they ran out of air, they went, what stopped them going up through the back door here? What stopped them over here, coming up through this way? The Byzantine Empire. The Byzantine, the Byzantine Empire still had the Roman. No one had ever defeated a Roman army in combat. No one. And now there was Roman army defeats, but that's because they were being, they were faced by barbarians being led by Roman officers. So they learned Roman tactics. All the Roman defeats, that you could argue that the fall of the Roman Empire came from the Roman armies fighting with each other. That's a good, that's a good place to start. They were so good that no one could beat them. So anyway, the Roman army was pretty tough. Now they probably could have stopped Mohammed by themselves, but they had built walls called the Theodosian walls around the year 380, around the year 400. Those walls are still there. They're 40 feet high, 30 feet wide, three sections. <coughs> so if you get over one wall, you're a target for the guy standing on the second wall. If you get through the second wall, you're a target for the guy in the third wall. Huge bricks. I'll show you pictures. I was there in 2005. Just amazing. And until gunpowder was invented, where you could blow holes in these walls, until that was gunpowder was invented in the 15th century and used <coughs> in combat, those Theodosian walls helped. So no one's going this way from what is today Turkey, and no one's coming this way from what is today uh, Europe, Eastern Europe, because the Byzantine Emperor did not have the Dark Ages. They had plagues and everything, but they didn't have the Dark Ages. So let's look at the status till about the year 1000 of ethics. There was no ethics then, it was all morality. What defined morality until about the year 1000? Well, if you lived in a green area, then you were handed down the Koran. This is your ethics. Boom, you're done. Still that way today in the Islamic countries. If you lived up here in these areas, we know the Holy Roman Emperor was Christianized by Western Christianity, what we call Catholicism today. Western Catholicism basically Christianized uh, the Western, uh, Western Europe in that time frame. So again, morality was handed to the people. Here's your morality. Ten Commandments, Golden Rule, Bob. In the East, right here in Byzantium, they always kept, they always kept the original Nicene Creed, and they're still there today. The Orthodox still are the Orthodox still there today. There was a small group of Christians. You hear about them every once in a while in the news, and they live in Israel. And when Muhammad conquered Israel over here, he let them be. They're called the Coptic Christians. The Coptic Christians come from about the year 200 or so. He 
before they happened. And they had a they had a major dogmatic battle with the with what was developing into the Catholic Church at the time. I'm not going to go into detail. Find me up here after class. I'll tell you about it. It's a great. It's a great. Anyway, they had a dogmatic difference, so they kind of split from the Greeks. And when they split from the Greeks, um, they kept their own Christianity, which is ancient. And now those are the ones you read about in the newspaper today, that they're growing up the churches and they're, they're becoming a very small minority in, uh, in Islamic countries in the, in the area of Palestine. But they predate everybody. They go way, way back. And, uh, and uh, their dogmatic difference is significant. And the Byzantine emperors always wanted to <coughs> make up with, they wanted to fix the, the emperors for hundreds of years trying to fix it. And they never quite could do it. Justinian came very close. Some of the emperors came very close to fixing it, but they still kept their separate culture. So we call them today Catholic Christians, uh, as opposed to and the Orthodox to become Orthodox. So until the year 1000, nothing much happened with mathematics except that the Arabs, when they came back, guess what? They brought back the zero with them. So the Arabs brought back this number system with them in, in what we call the Dark Ages. So if we look, we can see if we go down from Brahmin to Indian to Sanskrit, we start looking, oh, look at this. Now we start saying West Arabic, East Arabic numbers. Now, why did the Arabs like these numbers so well? They were great for computation, for trade. The Arabs were big on caravan, doing stuff like that, and this was great. For, for, we use them today. We call them Arabic numerals. Who would want to go back to doing trade with Roman numerals, right, or Greek symbols, or Babylonian images? So this was great. But why didn't the West pick up on it? Because they had the zero, and it was banned. It, was, it wasn't that we don't want to use it. It was blasphemous. You see what I'm saying? The Arabic numerals were blasphemous. And they were also easily copied. So they, they didn't, the, the West didn't like the way they were copied. So you were under edict of excommunication, which meant death at the time, if you used <coughs> these numerals during what we call Dark Ages. So guess what? The Arabic cultures flourished in that time in mathematics. Around the 9th century, in the Baghdad Caliphate, around the 9th century, a very famous mathematician, Muhammad al Khwarizmi. That's the only part of his name. But he wrote a book called A Jabbar. And we call that book today A Jabbar Algebra. Right? Al Khwarizmi in the ninth century wrote the first book on algebra using some of these symbols in his work. His name was mispronounced <coughs> in the West. We mispronounce his name, and the word algorithm comes from mispronouncing Al Khwarizmi. Ask Kokela in the instructor's class. I, I, I get no great joy of preaching Arab mathematicians to Faisal, knowing he can't dispute because they're all great men, you know. So Al, Al Khwarizmi developed algebra. They developed uh, the, the beginning of advanced mathematics. They were building math. So there was culture was flourishing all over, and what was causing that culture was the advancement of mathematics, which was banned in the West. Now, one of the reasons, and I'll stop here. One of the reasons that zero was accepted by the Arabs was because in the Quran it says God created the universe out of the void. So it wasn't that they were putting rationality on this high plane. It was that that version of rationality that the void was allowed, zero was allowed, fit into their theology. So theology still rules, still rules today, but it allows the void. Jews the same way, the Old Testament, read the Old Testament, Genesis. The word that's created out of the void. Right? It was basically the Christians who, in the third century, said, "No, no, no. The Greek. We're going with the Greeks. We want a rational world that's perfect and going. So we we don't accept the void. We don't accept zero. We don't accept these things." So it became blasphemous. Ironically, it became blasphemous in Western culture, leading to our dark ages and leading to the flourishing of culture in the uh, other cultures around us, including China, India, and of course the Muslim world. That'll take us to about the year 1000. We'll pick that up next. We'll show you how math pulled up to the year 1000. There was an event in, I'll give you the year. I'm pretty sure it was 1037. 
we, we would probably still be in that steady state today with the Western culture and the West Eastern culture and the, you know, if an event didn't happen in 1037. So I'll give you guys pens if you can figure out what it is next week. I'll, I'll pick up talking about that. But that, that event caused a crack in the Western culture. It caused, it caused a crack in our idea of allowing zero. And it eventually led to the Reformation and the Enlightenment and the modern world, I think. It was just one event. See if you can think of what it, what it was. We'll pick that up next week.